Hello, hello. Sorry for that technical delay this morning. I apologize for that. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm trying a uh, new way to write. <laughs> so I had to uh, essentially uh, cobble together a PowerPoint here. Um, so I think this should be a cleaner way to do the presentation today. Hello, everybody. I um, hope everything's going well. I don't have any um, paperwork for the good of the order to catch up on. Uh, so uh, we'll kind of jump right in today. Let's see, we have our, <laughs> we're down to like a dozen students. I'm sure everybody else is learning on their own. I'm sure it's fine. They'll watch it later. Um, so it's very good to see you guys. Um, I, I, I think you'll like today's uh, lecture. Hopefully you guys watched the video. Um, this is tough stuff. Uh, that, that is uh, the Max Planck video is pretty good. Um, again, I am no expert on modern atomic theory, uh, but I do appreciate it. And again, I don't think you guys have to be an expert on it either. I will share a link with you to a guy named Richard Feynman. Again, we talked about him before. He's the guy who's on the chalkboard. Again, he points out that no one really understands quantum mechanics. No one really understands the quantum view of the atom. There's still lots of arguments and debates about why all this stuff is happening. And so you just need to be a little patient, on, patient with yourself with this, I'll show you sort of a kind of a minimal coverage that you guys should know going forward on this. And again, it's okay to ask questions. Please email me with questions. I know that some of you guys emailed me this morning. I have not had time to get back to you yet. Um, but email me with questions, ask questions in the chat. Anything I do not answer today, I will answer tomorrow. And then also one of the things you guys might want to think about is that I've heard that other teachers are setting up like sort of a perma Google chat. Um, uh, if you would like me to set up sort of a permanent Google chat where you guys, I think, could, I, I guess, continue to look at the archive conversations in there, uh, that might be an easier way to communicate. So if you're interested in a archivable, like, perma Google chat for the class, um, just say that in the comments. Say, I would like a Google chat, and I'll figure out how to set that up. Um, but hello, Olivia, Maddie, Kennedy, Bree, Emily. Hello, all the ladies that are here. Good, excellent, nice job. Um, and so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about Planck himself. Again, this should supplement the video that you guys watched nicely. Um, and so this is, uh, you see a lot of old pictures of Max Planck, uh, but this is, I, I think, this is what he looked like when he had most of his discoveries. Um, uh, Planck was a very, very interesting person. Uh, and again, it's a shame that more people don't know about him, but he really was one of the most influential scientists of the 20th century. Uh, he was an interesting person. Um, let's see if I can get this to, there we go, there we go, ah, it works, excellent. And so he was a physicist around the turn of the century. Um, he would go on to win the 1918 uh, Nobel Prize for the work that he was doing. And really the work that he would do would start a revolution in physics uh, in the 20th century. When he went into physics, the legend goes that people were like, well, you really shouldn't go into physics. It's sort of been picked over. There's not really much left. As they said, there's a couple holes that need to be filled in, and that's about it. People felt very good about the classic Newtonian physics, which you have not learned about yet, but you will next year. And that really didn't bug Max Planck at all. Uh, he, he appreciated the ability to study, and he was okay with just sort of putzing around with what uh, was known and trying to discover what was left. And in that process, he would end up sort of like kicking over the stone that would show that there was a lot of unknowns still out there and he would uh, end up blazing the trail for none other than Einstein himself. In fact, uh, Planck was one of the first people that really sort of put Einstein out in front of the world and said, hey, listen, this is everybody, uh, this is somebody you should pay attention to. And in the end, uh, Einstein's popularity sort of eclipsed Planck's own popularity, uh, but Planck wasn't upset with that. Um, uh, Planck had a very tragic personal life. Um, anybody who lived in Germany, uh, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century had a pretty tragic life. Um, he had four children, and as I understand it, he survived all four of his children. Um, one of his sons uh, died in the Battle of Verdun, uh, which is one of the more horrific battles of World War I. It's just an awful, awful battle. Um, another one of his sons was actually um, executed. Uh, because of his involvement with an attempt to assassinate Hitler. And then um, both of his daughters, I think, died also during his life. Uh, one of them died during childbirth. They were twins. And then the other one um, died a year later after marrying uh, his sister's uh, or her sister's widow. 
So Planck certainly had a sort of tragic life, um, although his scientific accomplishments are known to this day. And so what, what Planck was doing was Planck was solving an industrial problem uh, because this was at the time of like incandescent light bulbs. And so the idea is that, um, and so here, let me see what I can show you here, uh, that we, we know that when we heated things up, they glowed. And that was the essence of the filament in the light bulb. And so the basic idea was that if you heated any object up hot enough, it would glow. And this was independent of the uh, makeup of the substance. When you got something hot enough, it would glow in a certain specific color based on the temperature. Um, and so that was called essentially black body radiation. Now there are no perfect black body emitters in the world. The sun's decently close. But again, things that get really hot enough, the molecules vibrate and then give off uh, electromagnetic radiation in the spectrum that we can see. Remember, this is important because we talked about this yesterday. You guys are giving off electromagnetic radiation right now in the infrared range. We just can't see that. But if the vibrations get uh, quicker and, and faster, um, then it starts, that radiation starts moving into the visible spectrum. And so that's what happens when you heat an object up. And you guys have all seen that in the laboratory when we heated things up, the wire gauze or whatever would start to glow. And that's what's considered sort of black body radiation. Um, again, you don't have to know all the details about this. I'm certainly no expert about this. But this black body radiation was a big, big problem for the way people saw the world. And this is funny because you guys obviously have not uh, thought at all <laughs> about classic physics much less the problems with classic physics. And so I think this will be sort of frustrating to some students because, you know, why are we, why do we care? Why was this a problem in the first place? <laughs> you know, and so you just got to kind of roll with it here a little bit. But anyway, so here was the problem, uh, was that what people saw in the laboratory did not match the mathematics of the view of the world. Uh, people had classic physics, which had worked really well for objects that were large and in our realm of existence. We're talking Newton and gravity, gravitational attraction, things that you're going to learn about in physics. Um, these things all worked really, really well. And physics seemed to be super successful across the board, which is why they didn't really feel like there was much left to be done with it. But one of the big problems still left in physics was the idea of what was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And so, so let's see if I can get my pen to work here. Here we go, it works. And so this is what people saw, is the idea that as you heated stuff up to certain temperatures, uh, what would happen is that they would give off light in the visible range. And so the colors would change depending on the temperature. And again, it didn't really matter what the object was. And so people saw this all the time. The problem was classic physics said that, well, that can't happen. In, in classical physics, what would happen is as you heated the object up, the wavelength would continue to go up, 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 up. And then eventually it would be going into the ultraviolet. You couldn't yet even see it at all. And so yeah, things would become invisible. And if you heated stuff up, you'd end up getting blasted with like high energy electro, uh, ultraviolet radiation. And obviously this doesn't happen. When we heat things up, they don't become invisible to the eye. And so that was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Uh, um, because again, classic physics could not explain why objects didn't disappear when they got heated up. And so this is what Max Planck was trying to figure out when he was trying to work on light bulbs and trying to make filaments more efficient. And Max Planck struggled with this for a very long time, um, uh, years in fact. And, and so in sort of a Hail Mary solution, and again, I'm, I'm skipping all of the math of, of, of the explanation, um, but he had to really throw out some of the big assumptions about classical physics. And so what he did to solve this problem, and again, this ended up being something that would change science forever, is that he said that energy itself wasn't continuous. Mm -hmm. And again, to you, this doesn't mean anything because you've never really thought about this before. But if you could imagine, you know, let's say that people could think of energy as a hill. And you could be anywhere you wanted on that hill. And what Planck said is, well, no. If this is going to work out, uh, the molecule's energy, the vibrational energy of these molecules cannot be continuous. I can actually get the math to work out if the energy is actually stepped. 
And so even though it looks like a curve to us, if you get close beyond the realm of observation to the totally tiny, if you get down really, really tiny, and if you step the energy instead of making it constant, the math actually works. And the equations that he came up with matched the observations in the real world. So he got the curves to match. Um, and again, this, this doesn't sound like a really big deal, but it, 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 it was heretical. Uh, it, it was the it was it was the antithesis of everybody thought about the world. It was really offensive. It was offensive to Planck himself. He did not like the idea of saying that energy came in tiny little steps, too tiny for us to see, but that they existed. He hated this idea. Nobody liked this idea. But when he when he used this concept, the equations matched observation. And so, out of desperation, he said, "Okay, we'll we'll just use this as sort of like a patch." to the problem, and eventually we'll get back and to classic physics. But for now, I mean, if this works, this works. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess sort of you can think of it as, uh, in the video I talk about, imagine that, you know, reality was pixelated. <laughs> you know, I mean, everything, you get as close as you want to anything in the real world, and it looks continuous. Colors look continuous. But what, what if you got really close to things in the real world, and then you realize that it was pixelated just like a screen, and you never really noticed it because you never looked close enough. Like if you discovered that reality was pixelated, like that would be a really big deal, right? That would change the way you looked at the world. And that's sort of what Planck did. I guess in the video, I like to talk about the idea of an ant staircase. You know, so imagine if you looked at a hill that you loved all your life, but then when you looked really closely, there was, it was actually carved out of tiny steps. In fact, every curve in the world was tiny little steps. That's sort of a paradigm shift. And, uh, and, and as much as Planck hated this idea, he, he did not like this idea at all, it stuck. Um, and in fact, um, it, it, he ended up coming up with an equation, uh, E equals H, which was called Planck's constant, nu, which was frequency. Um, and so I don't think he actually came up with the experimental value of Planck's constant, but he had some other people do it. And, and this value worked. Now you will see people talk about uh, the equation like this, E equals N H nu, which the I idea of uh, N being some kind of integer meaning it stepped up. You don't really have to worry about that at this level. But people always knew that energy was proportional to frequency. Okay, and we talked about that yesterday, right? As the frequency of energy goes up, right? If we have long wavelengths, again, that's low energy radio waves. But if we have really tiny wavelengths, I mean, and really high frequencies, remember that's super high energy. Right? You don't want to get hit by X-rays or gamma rays or cosmic rays or anything like that because the frequency is so low. That's because as the frequency goes up, energy goes up. And so that, that, that relationship was always known. And all Planck did was say, okay, well, you know, uh, let's just say that E equals H nu, where H ends up being this really, really, really tiny number. All right. And, and that, notice it's 10 to the negative 34th. <laughs> like, look how tiny that number is. And so that shows how tiny these steps were. Imperceptible. Like, there's no way to detect these things really uh, realistically at our realm of existence. But nonetheless, if we stepped things, if you stepped energy, things worked. And again, I can't state, I can't overstate what a huge deal this was. Um, and Planck really didn't like the idea of this constant but he could never escape it. In fact, what, has, what his legacy has become, Planck's constant, it has become one of the fundamental constants of the universe. I would say, I would arguably, after the speed of light, you will see Planck's constant crop up all the time in physics. It is showing up in all of these equations because it ends up being such a fundamental idea. In fact, there are things called like the Planck length that defines like the limits of what we can detect in the universe. Everything comes back to Planck's constant. Um, so it's a fascinating number. Um, anyway, so that's that's the coolness of, of this equation. And so uh, we're going to go, what we're going to do now is just go over a little bit of this math just to show you how this works. Um, but really, conceptually, this is the big idea, is that we get to the idea of quantized energy. And hence, we are about to introduce the concept of quantum mechanics or the quantum view of the atom. All right, and we are going to be taking the ramifications of this, and then we are going to be talking about Bohr and Einstein and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and all of the weird ramifications that a quantized energy gives us and a quantized atom gives us.
It's weird. It's really, really weird. And again, if you have a question, feel free to post it in the comments. Um, and again, if I don't get to it today, we'll get to it tomorrow. So Planck, again, superstar of physics and looks a little bit, if you look at the older pictures, a little bit like Mr. Hildenbrand, if you're one of my students. But um, So what we're going to do is we'll show you how to use uh, Planck's equation uh, just to solve the math of it, I guess, if you want to learn how to, how to calculate that. And so, uh, again, what we can do is for any equation is all we really need is the frequency uh, because just like C, uh, Planck's constant is a constant. And so if we know frequency, we can find energy. Another thing to point out, don't forget, is that uh, you know if energy equals Planck's constant times nu and C equals nu wavelength, right? We can solve this equation for nu. Nu equals C over lambda. And again, we can then substitute in. So E will also equal C over H over C over lambda. All right. And so, uh, this is really it. I mean, this is the limit of all the math that I'm going to hold you guys responsible for here. Um, we're not, any other math you see in any of the videos, like the wavelength of an electron or relativistic mass, you can just enjoy those as sort of like looking at units. Don't freak out about that stuff. All right. So let's let's look at this math example here. Um, let's see. So uh, do, do, do. So again, this is the same sort of thing we did yesterday. Right? We can take this idea of frequency and we can change it into, obviously we want to change it, get rid of the peta like we did yesterday. So just to review, right? if we have 30 petahertz, right? again, we have our metric prefixes. right? So we can go ahead and say that one petahertz is 10 to the 15th hertz. Great time. This is a great time to get better at your metric prefixes. right? And so we end up with 3.0 times 10 to the 16th hertz, okay? And then once we have that, even though these equations look really scary, they are not that scary, right? All it is is scientific notation. And so look at this, ready? So if we just take this equation here, right? Okay, E then equals Planck's constant, which is a constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds times our frequency of 3.0 times 10 to the 16th per seconds. Notice that if you ever forget the units for Planck's constant, they have to be joule seconds, right? Because joule seconds times per seconds is going to give us joules, and of course, energy is in joules. So uh, again, this looks very intimidating, but all it is is scientific notation, right? And so if I take 6.626 uh, times 10 to the negative 34th times, 3 times 10 to the 16th, uh, if you punch this into your calculators, I, if I remember correctly, I think you get uh, ba, 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 three. Uh, oh, no, yeah, I'm sorry. You get, do, 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 do. I don't know how to erase on this yet. Uh, you get about two times 10 to the negative 17th joules. All right, which again, doesn't mean anything to you really, but I mean, that would be the energy of what's called a photon. And we'll talk about what a photon is later. Right? And then again, all we can do is if we wanted to, we could convert that to something a little bit more useful. Right? So I had to look this up. Right? Uh, so one joule is 10 to the 18th atto joules. <laughs> so anyway, it would be about 20 uh, atto joules. <laughs> But don't worry about that prefix there. So there you go. That's, I mean, that, oops, I'm in the way. I'm, I apologize. I'm blocking uh, my answer there. I apologize. Let me here. Let me put it down here. 20. I can't move. <laughs> so anyway, that's how you would do the math for this. I, I wouldn't worry too much about the math. Use this as an ability to get good at solving variables. Use this as an opportunity to get good at canceling out units. Again, these units have to make sense. And I encourage you to solve E equals H new for each of those, solve it for H, solve it for new, and make sure the units work out, okay? And so really, wh where is this taking us? Um, again, this is taking us into uh, all the ramifications of quantized energy. Um, we're gonna talk about, uh, and I don't really talk about this too much in the video, but I will talk about it more, is the idea that um, we will uh, talk about what Planck did uh, in terms of quantized energy, where Einstein then picked up off that and one uh, uh, actually figured out uh, what's called the photoelectric effect. One of the three big things he did in one year, not only did he verify, <laughs> give, experiment, give experimental evidence of the uh, existence of atoms, or at least theoretical experiment um, that was later verified. So in one year, he like determined that the atomic theory of atoms was actually real. 
<laughs> he figured out the photoelectric effect and then like special relativity all in one year when he was a young dude. And so one of the things that we will be able to explain with this is the idea of bright line spectrum. So it's coming. We'll talk about that next time. <laughs> so that's it. That's all we'll do today. Um, again, not too many questions in the chat. Um, I will take, if anybody's still there, uh, I'll try to squeeze in a drawing here. I'm not sure where I'm going to put it here. I, uh, I, I should have added a blank screen at the end of this, uh, but I could draw a uh, short drawing here before I go. Um, again, no one has given me any feedback, I think, about the idea of a persistent Google chat. Um, I might try to start one of those anyway, if you guys are interested in that. Um, so again, last chance. Uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat for a drawing. Oh, a giraffe. Okay, well, all right, all right. Giraffe, giraffe, we can do that. A giraffe, all right, okay. All right, we'll do a combo here. I'll try to get them off to the side here um, because I um, I don't have much room here. Let's see if I can squeeze them in right here. We'll start with the giraffe. Oh, I don't know if this is going to look like a giraffe or not. Oh, I don't know if this is going to look like It's going to look like a bit like an ostrich, I think. Oof. This is a different thing to draw. Oh. Uh oh. This is. Nope. 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 Oh. 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 There's a giraffe. And. <laughs> There's a leprechaun right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got away with that one. Anyway, all right. So um, uh, tomorrow, I think, I think feel, I, I forgot what the weekly assignment speech says for tomorrow. I think tomorrow is a bit of a ask questions and review, I think. Um, we'll see what's on agenda for tomorrow. Uh, thank, oh, that was very nice. Thanks again, guys. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, maybe I'll come up with a review for tomorrow of the week's content. Maybe we'll Kahoot. Maybe, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what we do. Anyway, um, again, if you have questions, I apologize. I feel like we really are disconnected here. Uh, if you have questions about this content, please ask or email me. And again, I'll look into getting that Google chat set up. So um, please check out the enrichment information. There are so many good videos about Planck and the electro uh, uh, ultraviolet catastrophe and this quantum mechanics. Uh, you're doing yourself a disservice if you are not checking this stuff out. So spread the word. Uh, tell your friends to tune into the stream and stuff. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow, I guess. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, I miss you. Uh, keep your social distancing. Keep your family safe. And have a great day. You are missed.